Let's get started. So, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Ola Pierosi. I am one of the team members for the SDP website. So, any questions, you're probably going to be talking to me a lot. I am the lead data manager for the Bold Systems, and I've been working with DNA barcoding for about seven years. I have a master's in evolutionary biology, and I've had the privilege to do a lot of workshops around the world. So I have a little bit of experience with trying to help people get started on DNA barcoding. DNA barcoding got started here at the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario, which is in the southeast of Canada. What we do is basically we're kind of a, a headquarters for DNA barcoding here. So I am on the one on the left there. That's me. And the other team member for the SCP that you're probably going to have a lot of contact with is Mallory. Mallory has been working with the Bolt team for about three years. She is wonderful and she, she has a lot of knowledge uh, about the systems yeah. and, she, and she's been working with the SDP since it started. Quick intro, um, agenda of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to do a brief introduction about DNA barcoding and then we're going to go into the system and I'm going to try keeping this very concise and easy to understand. Uh, but please let me know if you have any questions. There is a chat field that you can post your questions there. I'm going to say it's very likely I might miss some of those questions. So feel free, if I don't respond to your question, feel free to uh, reiterate it at the end of the presentation. And we can open the floor for questions and discussions uh, then. Anyway, so we're going to do a quick SCP overview, and then we're going to do a student experience. So how do we submit data? What are the students going to be looking at? And then data analysis and visualization. So what are the tools that are available to analyze the data that the students are going to be uploading to the system? And then the instructor experience. So what are you going to be seeing and, and how can you monitor and validate the data? So one of the things that DNA barcoding is, is used for, I guess the, the, the main thing it's used for, is species differentiation and identification. And this year, what we're looking at is photos of this skipper butterfly. I think it's called the two-line flasher, I believe. So most of these things are identified by eye most of the times. But by eye, they all look the same, right? It's very difficult to identify cases where things look the same, but they might be different species. And DNA barcoding can do exactly that. So when this in this particular example, by barcoding all these specimens, what we've Found, they were actually divided into five different species when they were broken down. So this is a big problem because there's a lot of information that gets missed when we are grouping these things together just because of the way they look in, when in fact they are different species. An example of this problem in, in particular <clears throat> relating to the same butterfly was described in, in a paper, a very famous paper that came out uh, several years ago where they've discovered based on their DNAs, DNA barcodes, that there were actually 10 species of this particular skipper butterfly that had been overlooked. And that when they, you know, when they barcoded it, they saw that it clustered very differently. And when they looked at the caterpillars and the uh, food plants that they were eating, they're, it, it matched the, the barcodes. There were actually a lot of information that got lost because we didn't look at that information before when we assumed they were all the same. So how does DNA barcoding work? It's basically an assembling process. So it gets, it started with the specimen and associated with the specimen, there is the collection data. So the information of where that specimen was collected, as well as a photograph of that specimen. We tend to take photos and a tissue sample that then gets processed sent to the lab for processing and sequencing. And all that information, so the collection information, the the, the pictures and the sequence information, it all gets deposited into an online database, which is accessible from anywhere and to everyone, which is known as the Bold Systems Database. And the way this works is that DNA barcoding is based on a small region of a uh, gene that's found on the mitochondria. So DNA can be found in two places in an organism, in the, in the cell nucleus or in the mitochondria. And the ones that it's used for DNA barcoding is the one from the mitochondria. And as you can imagine, this is a very small, tiny, tiny part of the organism that we are using to identify it. So it's very small scale. 
but that has been translated into a large-scale project where now there are about, I believe, 20 countries involved in creating this gigantic DNA barcoding library from around the world. So we're getting species from, you know, all, all corners of the world. And we currently have about 2 million sequences on our database. All this data, because it's become such a, a huge project, it's all stored in the Bold Systems database, which I mentioned is this online source of the DNA barcoding data. And what's really interesting about Bold is that it, it's sort of like a Wikipedia for species because it's a community building database. It's scientists from around the world that add data to the database, and then they can share that data between scientists and comment and collaborate between each other. What's more, Bold also provides analysis tools that you don't just store your data in the system. You can also analyze and you can use these tools to publish and to ask questions about, you know, what kind of patterns am I seeing? Are there evolutionary significance to this? Is there an ecological significance? And, you know, among the most common ones that Bold provides is the Taxon ID 3. And I hope you can see my mouse as I move on top of it. So this is the Taxon ID 3. And it basically is a diagrammatic representation of all of a data set of species. And it clusters things that are similar in sequence versus things that are not so similar, <laughs> more different, I guess. It also provides a image library where you can see all the images for your collection. So any images that you upload, and then it's easy to compare, right? It, same in the case of those skipper butterflies. Once DNA barcoding was able to differentiate between those groups. If you look very closely, you might notice some little morphological differences between those different groups that you wouldn't have noticed before, and so on. So there are several tools that can be used. The most important thing is that the only way to build DNA barcoding is based on specimens. We need to collect more specimens and there's a lot more to be discovered. And one way of getting these new specimens and species into the system is through museums. So we have collaborations with several museums. These photos come, I believe, from the Smithsonian in uh, Washington, where we go to these museums and we basically take a little bit of tissue from their collections and come back to Guelph or also other places in the world, and we barcode those and add them to the library because museums have a lot of knowledge that sometimes, you know, doesn't get digitized. So it's very difficult to spread it around, right? So we are providing the ability to spread that information around what species those museums have. But another way of collecting specimens as well is through field collections. And we do a lot of that here, but also around the world. We have what's called the Biobus, which is this beautiful RV. And it goes around every summer through North America, collecting in different national parks and in different locations. So it has traveled through all of the US and most of Canada at this point. But we also have collaborations with other countries that nice red RV. It's from South Africa. And every year they have these expeditions that go out and collect samples in the, the Kruger Park and other parks in South Africa. And now we also have student collaborations. So students are able to contribute to this gigantic database and, and add to it, add, add scientific knowledge as well. So if you think about it, we know very little of what's out there. You know, it's estimated that there are about 50 million species and we only know or have described 1.8 million. And of those species that we described, we actually don't have barcode for a lot of them. There's still a lot that can be done. And if you can imagine, in terms of the student contribution, there's this a lot to be discovered and ownership of this exploration is possible through DNA barcode, right? Like they might be able to find new species that have never been described before or even contribute to sequences to to or barcodes to to species that we know but we have not barcoded before so there's a lot to be done there and on that note I'll introduce the STP data portal which is a student oriented or an education oriented version of bold that allows students to do all this same work I guess that 
scientists are doing to, to build to this library and analyze that data. So on that note, I think we are ready to start on the uh, demonstration for the website. All right, so uh, let's open the website. So for is for bold is bold systems dot org slash edu or stp so that's the home page so before we get started i'm just going to do a quick overview so in the home page we have some support information as well so there's a link to the system overview this is a quick brochure like uh let's say overview of the system what is its intentions and i think one of the things to note about it that i particularly find very useful is that there is a section on the analysis tools and it kind of groups analysis to tools together that you can use uh sorry where is it oh here that you you may choose to use them this way or not it might be useful when you're asking certain questions what are the tools that you can use together to answer those kind of questions when analyzing your data so that's just an uh, you know an option there's also a link to the quick start guide this describes a little in a little more detail how to use some of the functions in the system how do you sign in how do you uh, submit data and all that information and we also provide three video tutorials on the main topics that bold sdp covers so how do instructors register a class how they monitor it shouldn't work and as well as how students add work to to the system and then last on that box is the introduction video this is more of like a a nice video that we created to introduce Bold SDP. So I will not show the whole video to you guys, but I, I recommend that you watch it. It's I think it's great. <laughs> okay, so those are the, the main things on the homepage. Then there is the information on the toolbar. So we have FAQs. These are basically the questions that are most common for students and instructors, and they're separated into students and instructors. So the student part kind of has a, some biological significance to these questions, but it, it's mainly associated to the system. Then there's a link to the quick start guide. That's the same link as before. Then we get into a little bit of more analysis. These tools, the identification and explore, are tools that are available to anyone and you don't have to be logged in to use them. So the identification engine, it's associated to the bold library, actually. And what it does, if you add a sequence in there, it will compare your sequence to the whole bold library. It's sort of a blast situation. So I'm going to demonstrate how this works. I have a FASTA sequence that I copied, you know, this could be you've sequenced somewhere or you have a sequence and you don't know what that sequence is and you're trying to find out, you can use the systems to figure out what that sequence is. So all you do is you paste the fastest sequence in there and you can choose if it's a colon sequence or if it's an ITS or if it's a plant sequence, a plant gene, and you can choose the database that you want to use. I'm going to leave it on the species level database. I'm just going to click submit. It's going to process that sequence and compare it to everything else that's on bold. So it's not just STP. This is whole bold 2 million records comparison. And then this is sort of the page that you get. And it tells you if there was a match. So if that particular sequence matched with something, it gives you a little bit of a description of the taxonomic hierarchy for it. So in this case, I know it's an arthropoda. It's a mal mal lac Clostraca and an amphipoda and so on. And then it lists the top 20 matches. So to, you know, most cases will show to species level if there is one, or if there is no species name that matches, it would just show the genus and so on. And it gives you the percent similarity. So you can decide, is that high enough? Or, you know, like if it's a 50% match, then that's probably not likely the correct species, but if it's a hundred percent match, that means that the sequences were exactly the same and so on. So it's a it's a nice um, opportunity to look at sequences and to compare your sequences with everything else that's on the system. And then lastly is the explore button and you can access the explore from here or from down here as well. These three boxes in the system are just big buttons. So I'm going to click it here and explore is an opportunity. Again, you don't have to be logged in to use this, but it's an opportunity to look at and, and browse through the scientific or like a biological universe of species, let's say. So you can search the scientific names for species that you 
you might not know. So if you only have the common name for certain species and you want to find their scientific name, you can look through the ITS database and CBI or EOL. And also it links you to certain bold tools. So you can look at the taxonomy browser. So you can enter here, you have to enter the scientific name. So there's a little bit of a sequence of events that um, can happen here. So if you don't know the scientific name for something, you can search it and then you can enter it here and, and open these other pages. So I'm going to demonstrate how that works. I'm going to put a scientific name here. So basically what I did is I entered the scientific name of a species into the taxonomy browser and this links back to bold. And the taxonomy browser is based on all the species that we have in the library as well. And what it does, it's it shows information about that specimen as well as barcoding information. So it tells me that there are 12 records on bold for that particular species. It tells me where they, the, those are deposited, so where are they coming from. It shows me photos for those species. So I can click on the photos and, and choose which photo I want to look at. In this particular case, I believe they're exactly the same. But it also has a map of where those records are being found. So I see there are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean there. And it also connects to the GBIF map. So what is the distribution, the world distribution for this particular species? And I see, you know, they kind of are showing the Pacific and then also in the Austro-Asian area. Um, and, and so there is a lot of information. And this system, you can also browse through the hierarchy as well. So it will give you the full hierarchy of the taxonomy hierarchy for that species. So I know it's an ecto echnodermata and an asteroidea and, and so on. And I can click, let's say I, I want to know more about the echinoderms, then I can click on echinoderms and it will give me a list of all those echinoderms on both. So all those, all the hierarchy is linked. Okay. And then lastly, you can look at the public data portal and the difference between the taxonomy browser and the public data portal is that the public data portal actually connects you to the records on bold so these are specific records so why don't we give it a shot as well so i'm going to enter that same species and if you remember correctly here let's see if i can do this the taxonomy page tells me that there are 12 records, but actually none of those are public. So we might actually not be able to find any public records there, but let's give it a shot. Yeah, so in this case, it says there are no records, but here's what we can do. We can search a, a lot of different things here as well. So I can search Coastal Marine Biolabs and this will list all the records that have been deposited so that our part of coastal marine biolabs that are on bold public on bold right now so then you can open that and see all the information that's available so you have a photo that the you know the submitter submits the information about the taxonomy for that record a map of where that record was collected as well as the sequence and trace files that you can download so by clicking by choosing a species into the public data portal, students and instructors and, and whoever uh, wants to use the system will have access to those public records on bold, actual records submitted by scientists. Okay, so that's a little bit of the exploring part of the system. So I think we are ready to get started on the student experience. Let's start on the students. So I have made a few classrooms and I will share this information with you as well so you can go back to the system and look at these classrooms and explore and, and play around. These are task classrooms, so you won't damage anyone's data. So this one is called class 26, that's the username. And the password is LVT86. So I'm just going to log in. Then I'm just going to write that in the chat here so everyone has access to it. So just bear with me for one second. I recommend that you don't look at it now. Just wait until the end of the presentation to play around with the classroom if you can. That way you can replicate what we're doing if you like to do so. So this is basically how your classes would log in. So when you register an account, and we're going to go through that process a little bit later, 
you get a username for your classroom and a password for your classroom. And that information will be shared between all students in the classroom. And this is basically what they're going to be seeing when they log in. This is the student console and it has instructions on the side of how, you know, how do you upload data? How do you get started? How do you download data? And it also has the main tools that students are going to be using. So starting by the data management console, these are the uploading tools. And what Bold Student Data Portal has been able to do is separate all those components of a record so that students can work on different components separately or in collaboration with each other. You can have multiple students working in one component or in multiple components. Any, anything is possible, basically, by separating these four components. So you have the specimen data. This is mainly the collection information and the taxonomic information. Then you have an image, then the trace files and the sequence. And then the analysis console. These are the main analysis tools used by bold users. And they become available to students once a classroom has more than three records. For less than three records, unfortunately, these tools don't work. And then what it does, it's... It it piles all the class data together and it analyzes the whole class data. And we're going to go into more detail on those in a little while. So I'm not going to say anything anymore about them. And then you have the view data and download data. So students can download all the specimen data for the class. They can download the, all the trace files for the class as well as all the sequences. If they want to do other analysis or they want to investigate this differently or if you have a, a project in mind that they can use this information elsewhere, it's available for them. So let's get started by adding a record into Bold. So the first step, so it's important that you follow the puzzle pieces when you're doing this. It always has to start with the specimen data because if you don't have specimen data, you can upload the images, trace files, and sequences to a record. So we're going to start here. And this is pretty straightforward. It's basically a form filling form, I guess. Um, and we provide instructions on the side as well of what the, what's the information that should be going on each of these boxes. So to get started, the first thing that we have to do is attribute the students. So which students from the classroom were involved in getting this information or are filling this information out? And, and this can be one person or can be multiple people. So what happens is that you get a drop down menu of all the students' names. So if, if I'm a student and I'm adding this information, I'll just go select myself. And if I'm working with someone else, if I have a collaborator, I can just add students and add someone else into that list, how many, however many people are associated with that record. And what this is going to happen is that when that record is published on, on GenBank or it goes public on Bold, all these students associated with the record will be attributed. So their names live on with the record, basically. So starting by the sample ID. So for sample ID, um, they all have to be unique on bold. So if it's a very simple sample ID, like A1 or B1, it's very likely already exists on the system, and it's very likely won't be accepted. We suggest a particular format for sample IDs, which might help with making sure they are unique and students can keep track of their own sample ID, which consists of the year, so 2013, the name of the school, which in this case will be HSC for Centennial High School. Uh, oops, and then the initials of the students involved, so in this case would be KW and CR and just a sequence number. So then those students will know that they were associated with that record, that that's their record, as well as, you know, if they create another record that can be 002 and so on. But student sample IDs are open to anyone and you can put whatever you, you need on your sample ID. So that was just a recommendation. Okay, then live stage. So the particular specimen I have is a Lepidoptera. So I know I have an adult based on the, my collection, but I don't know the sex and I don't know its reproduction mode. So I'm gonna leave those as, as is. So then taxonomy, you just fill it out from the drop-down menu. So I'm looking for arthropoda. Uh, there it is. And then insecta. 
And again, this information, if you only have the species name, one tool that you can use for this would be the taxonomy browser would provide you the hierarchy if it's available on both, but also IDIS and, uh, and CBI can provide that information as well. Order, we have Lepidoptera, and then family. All right, okay. Um, that's my species. I'm Lacodidae. Day. Um, I don't have a tribe, but I know my genus is Eclea. There it is. And then my species is Eclea Delphine. There it is. Okay. And then I identified this particular species based on morphology, so just based on their physical characteristics. So that's what I'm going to put there. Um, and that's it. And then the collection information. So who collected it? In this case, it was Jane Smith. And actually, one of the students helped collect. So let's say Zachary. And I mean, this is all test data, as I mentioned. So it's just to give an idea of how the system would work. And it was collected. So here, the format for the date is date. Sorry, day, month, year. So make sure you follow this format. Otherwise, it can be very confusing. And if you switch the date and the month, and the, the month comes out as like 20 or something, the system won't accept you, you through an error message. Country was collected. Uh, it was the United States. There. And in Michigan. In Blue Lake Country Park and White River. Now, the most important thing I would say here for the collection data, although perhaps not the most important thing, is the uh, GPS coordinates. Because by providing GPS coordinates, it allows um, students to, to, to view that map. The, the map of where the specimen was collected only appears with GPS coordinates. So it's very important to add those as well. And there's one more thing I wanted to mention that I forgot. There are a few fields in this form that are required, and these include the phylum. So all records have to have a phylum, as well as a country information. If these two fields are missing, the record won't go through. So in this case, the my latitude is 43, 53, 28, and longitude minus 86, 23. Okay, and then you can, so once all the form is filled out and you have the student attributions, you can click submit. Oh, there you go. I, I put the date incorrectly. So error messages will be thrown if there is anything wrong. And, and it, Usually it's very helpful because you can figure out what is wrong, like what, what went wrong. So, and the system is um, in a sense, pretty self-sufficient. So if there's anything that's obviously incorrect, you will let you know. So, so that's a, a plus. Okay, so let's try that again. So once the record is created, you get a confirmation page and it basically uh, tells you, do you want to go back to the main console and add more information? You can view your specimen page and I won't do that um, yet. I'm going to add a photo first or you can view the whole class data. So why don't we go there just to see what it looks like? So here basically is a list of all the class information and students who have access to this, this page as well as instructors. And so I'm not going to go into too much detail about it right now. But as you can see, there is the new record we just created. So it, it's automatically added to the list. So now that I have a record, I'm going to go back and add a photograph to it. So I go to number two, add photo. So now this is a really interesting tool. The lookup button is, let's say I don't remember what my sample ID is. Um, I can press on the lookup button and it will open that list page and I can just copy that information for my sample and paste it in there and it, um, and it finds. So it's a way that if you can't remember your sample ID is, but you have other information, you know the species name or so on and so forth, you can find that um, you don't have to type it in.
And once you enter the correct sample ID in, the system will let you know the status of that particular record. So in this case, it tells me I don't have any trace files uploaded yet. I also don't have any photographs or any sequences to that particular record, which makes sense. So now I'm just going to choose photo and I'm going to choose my image that I've already set up. So I can show you what the image looks like there. Um, and then once I uh, insert my image, I also have to put view meta metadata. This is basically the orientation of the photo you're looking at. So in this case, I'm looking at the lateral view. So that's the information that you would put in here. Caption is useful for, for things like I can say here that this was a pinned insect. But if you have a photo taken in the field, you might want to say pin. You might want to say what it was. Uh, and the photographer is the name of the person that took the photo. In this case, is also Jane Smith. Um, and don't forget to attribute students. So here, let's say it doesn't have to be the same student contributing the four components of the record. So you can have some students concentrating on photos, some concentrating on traces, and so on and so forth. Whatever works for the classroom. So in this case, let's say that Jared was the one that was uploading the photo, so he gets the credit for the photo for the image submission. And then you click submit, and you get basically back to that same page. So now our specimen page is complete. So I want to see what my specimen page looks like. So I'm going to open that and close it over here. This is what it looks like. So basically, it has all the information we added. So it has the sample ID that we created. Bold will uh, automatically provide a process ID. I don't think you guys have to worry too much about it, but basically what it is is an automated unique number that allows us to associate that record in the database. Uh, it has the institution that's storing that sample, um, as well as the taxonomy information that we provided, the geography of where it was collected. And because I put those GPS coordinates in there, it tells me the exact location of where it was collected, and it can zoom in in that map and see exactly where it's coming from, as well as who collected it, when it was collected, and so on. And as you can see, it already gives the contributions, so I know who was involved in submitting or contributing to that specimen and who was involved with the image submission. Okay, so that is the specimen page. So once we have the specimen page complete, we are ready to submit trace files. So this is the next step. Basically here is where you'd be sequencing your specimen and I believe you'd be getting trace files from CMB, but I'm not 100%. I'm sure Ralph can, can uh, talk more about that one. But anyway, so you get the trace files that you have to submit to the record to create the sequence side of your specimen. DNA barcoding is basically made of two portions. You have the specimen information and you have the sequence information. So we completed the specimen information, but now we're going to start on the sequence information for that same specimen and associate it. So the way we associate that information is through the sample ID. So again, I'm going to look up that same sample ID. And in this case, actually, I want to upload traces to a different sample because now I'm working on a different sample. I'm collaborating with a different student on a different sample. So I'm going to actually submit trace files for this. So I copy that, I paste in here. And in this case, again, it tells me there are no photos, no sequences, and no traces for that particular specimen. Then I choose which PCR primer I used. And there we have, we provided a drop down menu with the main PCR primers, but if there's any other primers that you are using in your class that are not in this list, please contact us and we can work on adding those as well. So in this case, I actually have four more primers, so I'm keeping those the same. And then the sequencing primers as well, you have to enter that information there. And then I can choose my primers. So I choose the forward. And then I choose the reverse primer. And here is very important to note that you have to upload both primers together. If you only have a reverse or a forward, the system will throw an arrow. You won't be able to upload them. So I make sure that you're always uploading tray forward and reverse together. You can upload more than one 
trace file per record. Let's say you have two forwards and two reverse, that's fine, but you have to make sure that whenever you're filling out this form, there's a, a forward and a reverse. Okay, and then I'm adding student attribution again, and I'm clicking submit. So the system, as you can see, it's very straightforward, and it's basically the, the, throughout the four components is a form filling system. So once you do it a few times, you get very used to the, the routine, and I think that that's what we're trying to do, get, you know, simplify it as much as possible that you can get used to this routine. Okay, and then lastly, we're going to add a sequence. And so I'm going to go back to that same sample I just added the traces for because that's the one I'm concerned with now. So as you can see, now it tells me, the system tells me there are two traces because I just uploaded those traces. Now, what Bold SDP is providing is an automated sort of sequence editor. So once you have your traces upload, what you can do is click on that button that says Bold Sequence Editor, and it basically a simplified version of programs such as code and cold and any um, trace assembling and trace editing program. And this allows students to, first of all, have a look at the trace and actually see what it looks like, but also edit it and, and manipulate it as necessary. So you can see the peak colors. So these are the same peak colors that you'd be getting from any other trace program. And you get the quality scores. So basically, uh, the blue background line tells you the quality scores and the and for the two traces. So even though these have very small peaks, it just means that their signaling was low, but the quality of those peaks is still quite high. And then down here, it gives you the assembled sequence. So basically comparing the forward and the reverse trace, fi trace files and giving you what is the nucleotides that should be there. So in this case, Oh, and the color of these little blocks is based on that quality. How well did the system, was the system able to tell me what that uh, nucleotide was supposed to be? So as you can see, the quality value. So when the quality is higher than 50 is green, and when the quality is really low is red. So students and instructors can go through the sequence editor and, and have a look at it and see okay, you know, how is my sequence looking like? Is there anything that looks out of place? And um, they can actually manipulate this. So let's say, you know, I'm not 100% sure this was supposed to be a G. They can click on it and they can say, I actually wanted this to be an A, C, T, or whatever. In this case, it's definitely a G, so I'm going to leave it alone. But once you modify it, you can see, even if you modify it to the same thing, it turns into a pink color, which says, somebody touched that particular nucleotide. It's no longer just based on the, the um, program. So once you have a look through the sequence and you're happy with how it looks like, you know, you, you, you called the bases that needed to be called, you just click on save. And the system will ask, do you want to do it? Yes. And it adds that sequence to the system. Now, it's not done yet because we still have to process that sequence and the system will do a step-by-step process. So the next step is basically cutting out the primers. So we trim, we, we want to trim the primers so that when we are assembling the sequences or we're comparing it with other sequences in the system, they all align correctly, right? So I, because I, when I was uploading my traces, I said my primers were the former primers, it finds those sequences for me. And all I have to do is click that button and it finds the portion of my sequence that matches the primer, and it basically trims the sequence starting from that point. So this part of my sequence is no longer in there, like it's being trimmed off because it's, it's actually the primer. So I, next step is to check for contaminants. So are there major contaminants? These are, is this a human? Is the major contaminants that you can find on a sequence? And it says, past, my sequence is not a contaminant. This is a short list of contaminants. There, It's still possible that the sequence is not the correct specimen, that it could be a different organism or a very similar organism. But uh, I think we checked against humans, pig, mice, which are the main contaminants that you can get in a lab, basically. 
So, and then the last step is everything is good. I passed all the necessary steps, so I can just click submit. Oh, and it tells me I didn't include a student. So I actually have to go back and contribute a student. Otherwise you cannot submit a record. So that's really, really useful because that way it ensures that students always get the attribution for the, the work they have done. So you can't submit anything if you don't add the student contribution. Okay, click OK. And again, it's the confirmation page. And now my sequence page is complete. So I'm going to have a look at what that looks like. So this is what my sequence page for my specimen looks like. So as I mentioned, the barcode record is made of the specimen and the sequence. And these two pages are basically linked on to that one specimen, right? And then the sequence page, you have the FASTA file of the sequence. Uh, you have the amino acid sequence as well. You have the information about your traces and you can view your traces. It usually takes about two to three hours for our systems to allow you to view traces. So if I click on this button right now, it won't actually work. But once you have the quality for those traces, then you'll be able to view the trace files as well. And it also shows illustration of the barcode. So based on the nucleotide colors, it creates this pretty barcode photo for your specimen. So that is that. So that is a full record that we created on Bold. So now, if I can do this back, make a Okay, so now um, I can, if I look at my class data, remember that we added two records. This here will tell me what kind of information is on the record. So I can see the little globe, it tells me that there are GPS for that record. The camera tells me that there is a photo. This little paper thing is the flag legend. And then this is the sequence. So basically for a record to be complete, it has to have all four. And that tells me all four components have been added to that particular record. Okay, so I hope that's pretty straightforward. The system, it's made to, to be easy to follow and easy to, to do with very little explanation. But one thing I forgot to mention is that on all those four components, there are instructions available on the left side of the screen. So if students do come into problems, they can um, look at those. They tend to be step-by-step, step, very helpful, but they can also, if there are problems still, you can um, can send an email to us. Is there a way to edit the sequences after the students submitted to both? Yes, we're going to get to that. Students are not allowed to edit the sequences once they are uploaded to both because we didn't want to, students to be manipulating each other's data and so on, but instructors have the ability to edit the sequences as well as delete a sequence if that, that was the incorrect sequence. So once we get into the instructor side, I will show you how to do that. So let's speed it up a, a little bit. So now let's look at some of those analysis that students can have once the data is included. So what I'm going to do is open a different classroom. So I'm going to log out of class 26 because this other class that we've created has a little more data. So it's a little more fun to play with the analysis tool. And this is class 30 and the password is NNK. 22. And again, I'm just going to add that to the chat and feel free to play with this as well. So now let's look at some of those analysis tools. So as I mentioned, the analysis console has the major tools used by Bold. And here I think the interesting, it's, it's where it gets really interesting because, you know, the system allows students to play with the data and ask these scientific questions that scientists are asking based on their data. So there's a lot that can be done in here as well. So when I click on these buttons, it basically analyzes the data for the whole class. So I'm going to click on view the taxonomy tree. This is, as I mentioned, the most commonly used, I would say, of the bold tools. So it allows you to, to choose a few things based on the, on the selection. So you want to create a, a tree based on nucleotide sequences so that will be fine. I want to have the phylum on my tree and I don't want any geographic information. And I'm going to leave everything else as is. And I'm just going to say build the tree. So there are a few options to build it. And 
it tends to be quite fast. So I can view what that looks like. And then all students would have access to this. And when you click on those buttons from the console, it basically takes the whole class data. So um, I think this is a little bit too small to see. Maybe this will help. So basically, it builds the connection between all my samples that I have on my tree. So um, in this case, I have a lot of single species. So everything, in fact, on my class is a single species. But let's say I had two specimens of the same species, I would mean that I have two lines under this. So it creates this clustering uh, system. So this is a commonly used analysis tool to illustrate how similar these sequences are in the class and, and so on. Uh, you can also use the identification engine. Um, this is the same tool I mentioned before, where you paste the FASTA file and you get a report of what that sequence is compared to the whole bold library. I'm not going to click on it. The only difference here is because I am in the class. When I click on it, it will take the whole class data. So anything in the class, it will compare all those samples with everything on bold. The barcode gap analysis, I just have to move the screen. I'm going to take basically everything. Again, there's some filters and perimeters that you can select, and there's a little bit of an explanation of what they are. But this tool basically compares the difference between the sequences. So this might be a little bit complicated to explain, but it's the differences between intraspecific distances and interspecific differences. So if there's an overlap between my species, so are there things that overlap and I can't tell them apart very well, or there's no overlapping my sequences? So there's like a, a little analysis that you can do that, as well as the image library. Again, this basically takes the photos for all my samples on bold and just puts them all together. So I can look at all of them and compare what they look like. In this case, they're all very pretty fish, aquarium fish, I believe. And then the last is the map. So the map is based again on GPS coordinates and it tells me where have these things been collected, have many things. So, you know, based on this particular data set, I can see between five and 50 things were collected in, I can't tell what, where that is, um, in here, but everything else is probably between one to five specimens and they've been collected basically all around the world. Um, okay, so th those are the main analysis tools used, but there are other analysis tools available to the class once they go into the class list. And these include an alignment browser, so, and here, what's interesting as well is that, let's say I don't want to look at the whole class data, I'm only interested in a few records, then here I can select the records I'm interested in and then click on those tools and I'm only going to see um, what's associated with that. But the alignment browser, I think, would be a really useful tool for, for the classes as well because it, if this works, Okay. Oh, it's just taking a moment. Sorry. So the alignment browser is um, an illustration of what the alignment for the class looks like, basically. So it will align all the sequences together so you can see how, you know, how many mutations are happening, like what's the sequence composition differences between these different sequences. So it's very useful. I won't try the alignment browser again. It might just be taking a little bit of time to load because there are quite a few sequences. But and then there are all these other tools that we discussed as well. So there's a lot that, you know, a lot of questions that can be asked here. And these are the same tools that would be used that are available on bold proper. So all the same tools that scientists are using to do their, their research. OK, so moving on, I believe we can go to the instructor experience now. So I'm going to log in as instructor now and show you what that will look like. So I'll start. So here, the login information, and you can also use this login information, is S retinazing, and the password is DNA barcode. So I'm just going to include that here as well. So feel free to use this account. Again, this is a testing account. I'm going to log in to create a new instructor account. I think 
everyone at this point already has one, but it's fairly straightforward. You can just click create a new account. Um, only important thing to keep in mind is that you need to enter a group code to make sure that you get an instructor account instead of a just a normal bold account. And one another thing I will mention, and I think that's probably not relatable to anyone in this particular group, but if you already have an account on Bold and you're having trouble creating an account on S Bold SDP, it's likely because your email is already being used on that Bold account. What we can do for you is we can transfer your Bold account into a Bold SDP account if you request to do so, but all records that you have access to on Bold, will you, you won't have access to those anymore. Or you may choose to open a bold SDP account under a different email address. So you can do that as well. So just to keep in mind, if you don't have an account yet, or if you run into trouble when trying to create an account. Okay, so let's get started by registering a course. So here we're going to register a new course. So once you create an account on bold, you receive an email from us, either myself or Mallory, with registration keys. To create a class, a course, you need to enter these registration keys. So I am going to do that. If you don't have registration keys or if you run out of registration keys, please let us know and we can provide more as necessary. So in this case, I have S E P one three seven seven D M. All right. Um, and then the teacher's name is basically your name or the name registered to the account, but I can add co-instructors as well. So if you are collaborating with different teachers, even from different schools, you can add co-instructors. And what it means is that they're going to have the same access level to the data as you do. So they'll be able to edit the data, approve data, validate it just the same as you. Then you want to put the institution name for your account. In this case, it's uh, Centennial High School. The district, it's Peel District. The city is Guelph, Ontario. And then the course, it would be the course name. So let's say Biology course, the grade level. So grade 10, 12, so on, and the school year, which is 2013. Now, this is a new um, tool that we have on Bold. What you can do is add student names manually, or you can select import from Excel. And all you have to do here is paste the list of your student names and emails into two columns. So you can either download the template and use that to create. So where do we get the registration key? Hi, Anna. OK. Uh, we provide those via email once you create an account. You get a welcoming email with five registration keys. So if you don't have that and you already have an account on Bold SDP, you can email edu at boldsystems.org and uh, we can provide new registration keys for you. Or you can email me directly or, or, or Mallory. And I'll provide those email contact emails at the end as well. The group code is always the same. So there are actually two group codes that we provide. One, and I'll write them down, is edu-bold-cmb if you are associated with CMB or edu-bold-sdp if you're not associated with um, CMB. So those are the group codes and they're always the same. But if you do, you know, if you have someone else or if you if you need the group call or you forget, you can, again, email edu and we can provide those as well. OK, so here I'm going to demonstrate how this works. So I have made a list of students names and emails and I am going to add them here. So here I just want to point it out that you are not required. You have to put the student names, but you're not required to include student emails. It's up to you. If you do include student names, they are not going to be used. We are not going to be contacting any students about any data. These will not be released to anyone. So their privacy will be kept in that sense. What the benefit of including student emails is that when you're monitoring the class and you're trying to validate data, we provide the option that you can communicate with students directly 
So you can click on a button and it says email the student and you can email the student about that particular record uh, directly. So that's the benefit of including student emails. So this is basically what it should look like. The names, a list of names and a list of emails, no title to the columns. And then you click OK and it basically fills out the information. So this you can fill up to um, a maximum number of students that we allow per class right now is 300. So you can fill up to 300 students in there. We don't, I, I just want to point out that we don't recommend having 300 students in the class, especially if it's your first class, just because it's going to be a lot of data to manage, but you know, up to you um, how you prefer to proceed. Okay, so once that's done, you can click Submit. And then you get this confirmation. And here, uh, it basically is a summary of the information you provided, as well as it gives you the username and password for your class. And this is the information that you want to share with your students. So in this case, my username will be class59, and that's my password. All right, so once that's done, we can go back to Home. And now that we have classes, and once you have classes and your students are providing data, what you're going to want to do is manage those courses. So then you click here. And this is basically the instructor console, and it summarizes the information for, your, for all your courses. So what you can have is you can have multiple courses that you're managing. In this case, I have four courses that I manage, and I can click on course info. And here it gives me the number, all the students associated with that course, how many records that class has or that course has uh, created, how many sequences that course has created as well. And I can add a co-instructor. So let's say when you create a class, you are not collaborating with anyone, but you know, you, you mention it to a different teacher in your school or in a different school and, and they seem really interested to collaborate. You can add a co-instructor at any point. The only prerequisite is that that person has to have a bold instructor account as well. So you won't be able to create or to add a co-instructor, pardon me, if they don't have an account on bold. So they would have to have an account. And then once they do, you can add whoever you want, basically. And then here, as I mentioned, you can add students to the class as well. So let's say, you know, when you're adding all those students, you forgot one or two, you can add them as well as you can remove students from the class by clicking on the little garbage cans. And it will tell, it, this gives a summary of all the information. So how many, you know, how many specimen records that students associated with, how many traces, how many images. So that goes back to that attribution. And this is really helpful in terms of um, monitoring shouldn't work, right? Like you'd be able to see, okay, this person hasn't contributed that much in this area, but has contributed a lot in this area. So it's, it's a nice sum, summarized way of keeping track of that. And then here is again, if the email was provided is where you can click and you open your email account. In this case, it's trying to open my email account and you can send the email to that, that student right from here. Another interesting tool that instructors have here is this ability to retire course. So once the course is done, maybe the school year is done or you know the project is complete, you can retire the course, which would basically remove the course from your view. So all the records that are in your queue would be removed from, so you wouldn't be able to see those records anymore. So you only really want to do that once you're sure that project or that course is done. So by clicking on the course name, it links you back to the page, that specimen page. So this again is what the same course record list that the students will be seeing. But instructors have, again, a little more ability. As I mentioned before, instructors can add the records. So let's say you notice some information that you shouldn't provide it is missing. You can click on the sample ID and what that does, it opens the specimen page that we've saw before. And then here instructors have this button up here that says add specimen. So if you click there, uh Oh, so that's a little bit of a mistake that we're going to fix. But the idea is that when you click there, you can, um, Add, edit any of the information provided. I'm just going to try a different one. It might just be the one I chose. 
there you go. Yeah, maybe that record was incomplete. So then basically all these fields become available and the instructor can add some more information. Let's say there's information about the taxonomy that wasn't included when the student created that record, then the instructor can you know, say something here. For example, we can say the specimen was partially damaged. Anyway, any information that should be included in the record that it wasn't. And then you submit, and then that information gets added to the record. The same thing can be done with the sequence. So I actually clicked on a, one that doesn't have a sequence. So once you click there, so you basically see the same page with the only difference is that you have these extra buttons here. So you can clear sequence. This will <laughs> remove this whole FASTA file from the, the record. And again, maybe it was the incorrect sequence that was added to the specimen or there was something <laughs> wrong with the sequence. So you can do that or you can edit sequence, which basically transforms the, the sequence into a text box and you can just add or, you know, TG or you can <laughs> remove nucleotides and you just update and it updates the sequence that you you created. Uh, okay, so those are some of the abilities that teachers will have that students don't have. And it's very useful because, <coughs> you know, you, you should be keeping track of these records and, and you might be need to validate it that way, right? As well, this page provides a student activity so this is for all the courses together. So in this case, I have four courses, so quite a few students. And again, the, the more students you have, this list are gonna get bigger and bigger, but it tells you basically multiple times in a day, what are the, the activities that have been going on? So for example, the information that we just added, the new specimen image trace and sequence is already on the list. So here you can tell which student was involved what did they do and in which course they're registered in. So again, I can see here that Krista just added a new sequence. That was one of the actions that we performed. But when I click on it, it gives me a little more detail about that event. It says a new sequence has been added, when it was added, in which classroom it was added, who, what the student involved was, and what record in, was involved in that. So. It gives me a little bit of information. So again, this is an, a nice way to keep track of, you know, how is the activity in the class? You know, has nothing happened in a month? No one has touched any of these records or there's a lot of activity going on. Which are the students that are mostly involved and so on and so forth. And you can search. So let's say I want to see, you know, how many things Jared has done because... I don't know how well he's doing, or I, I want to find out, you know, how much he's contributing. Then you can just search the name and you pull out any any activities that that student's involved with and what those activities were. And then lastly, I believe I have a question about clearing the data. So let me look at it. If you clear the sequence, can you repeat the sequence editor process to review the alignment? trace files again yes you can so once you clear the sequence you're only clearing the sequence so you're not clearing the um, trace files so you can review so you can basically go back to that add new sequence and do the whole process again and, and review it that way and then lastly you have the record approval queue and this is i think the most the coolest thing and probably one of the most important this gives you the ability to validate the record because these records that students are creating are actually going to end up published on GenBank and going to be part of the bold public resource that's used by scientists you know, in, in research around the world. It's very important that we validate that data very carefully and make sure that we are providing uh, really good quality data. So as instructors, there is a first pass of the validation that you are responsible for. And this basically summarizes and, and helps identify areas that need more work and what uh, needs to be records that need to be looked after and, and records that are ready to be approved. So basically, this lists all the records, again, in all the classrooms. Once the four steps have been implemented, 
So once you have the you have a specimen record, the record will appear in this list. And as the components of the record are added, there you're, you're going to get check marks or, or cross marks and so on. So, for example, this first record we have here, which is the thirteen CHS DP zero zero one. In this one, everything has been added. So we have one image to that record. We have two trace files as well as have a sequence of 593 base pairs and the sequence quality is good. So this gives me the ability to say, yes, this record is complete. I can approve it or no, this record is not good. And I think one important thing to mention here is that even though this record is complete, complete it doesn't necessarily mean that it is in good quality to be approved. It's important to go back and look at it to make sure all the data is there. So instructors from here would have the ability to click on the record and again, open the specimen page and the um, sequence page. So this is a good example. You know, the record is complete and everything, but this photo is quite small. So, you know, I mean, that might be the only way of the only photo that was provided, but this would be a nice opportunity to ask the student could this photo be cropped? You know, can we, can, can we, is there a photo that is a little more zoomed in before submitting this record? Uh, and then there are other things you should look at, right? Like has the GPS been provided? Has all the information, is it correct? Does the GPS point, oops, maps to the country? So in this case, the country that was selected was Canada and the GPS in the, where it was collected is Canada. So that's, that's good. So these are the sort of things that as an instructor is a, as a first pass in the validation process, they need to be checked. But once you're confident that the rec record is correct, you can go ahead and submit. And basically, once you approve a record, you will say, yes, you want to approve. You say, OK. And that record is removed from your list. And it goes into a separate list that will go through a second level of approval and that record is out of your list. Another thing that uh, might happen is records like this where, you know, none of the information is there or some part of the information cannot be submitted. So you might never have a photo. What will happen is if you, as long as there is a cross in this line, you won't be able to approve that record. So you, you, you won't get the check mark that you can click on it. And if that's the case, you can choose to say, I, I'm going to retry, I'm going to take another photo, I'm going to sequence it again. Or you might say, you know, this record, I prefer to start from scratch, this record won't work. And in that case, you can click on the cross and this rejects the record. And that record is basically deleted from your list and it's also not going to move forward to being published. So there is a risk here in terms of the, the student contribution being lost. So it's something to keep in mind. But sometimes, you know, the record's never going to be completed and you don't want it in your list anymore. In that case, you click reject, OK, and it also removes it from your list. So you only have on your list records that are in progress or that, you know, you haven't been able to come and see it in a while, but you have a few to, to approve and look at. So I think this is a really cool tool to be able to organize yourself and, and validate the records. So that's, I think, the overview for the instructor. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about the, um, the publication steps. So once the record has been approved here, what happens is that it goes into, as I mentioned, a second phase of approval where I believe Ralph and Linda um, have, have a closer look at the record, make sure that it follows the compliances for DNA barcoding and, and, you know, there's no sequence contaminations and so on. And once they approve those records, those will be submitted to go into GenBank and then the and student contribution is maintained. You know, if, if anyone, any student that is associated with submitting the specimen, the image, the traces, they get attributed for the work that they have done on GenBank as well as on Bold. So once the, the record goes to GenBank, it also goes into the public database of Bold where any scientist or anyone basically can go and access that record. Even, even the students can go back. And I just want to show a little bit of how, how that looks like. So I'm just going to go into 
Gold Systems. So this is the main website, goldsystems.org. Um, and I looked through these a little bit earlier today and I found a couple of records that have student contributions that were submitted by CMB. So I'm going to see if I can do this here just to show a little bit of what it would look like. These were a little bit different. They, they won't have the same format as the records coming from STP will, just because these weren't submitted through STP uh, just yet. But I believe this is a student contribution. And Ralph can correct me if I am wrong. <laughs> so this is what the record would look like. So it would be the same, same exact format for records contributed by students. And then basically here where it says attributions, it will say everyone's names involved with the record. So who was collected, everyone that was involved with the specimen, everyone that was involved with adding that specimen, who collected the specimen, but as well as the students that uploaded the specimens, as students that uploaded the images, and so on and so forth. And so that information will live on. And they, the, I think the cool thing here is that these are real contributions of important data that, you know, it's being used all around the world. So... In that note, I think that is the end of the demonstration, and I think we are running out of time anyway. So I'm going to open the floor for questions now. So if you want to unmute your microphone, and if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to discuss them now. Uh, this is Dave. This is David Hinden. I have a question about the uh, SDP account. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, did I understand you to be saying that? I need to use a different email account than the account that I have for Bold to be able to do that? Yes. If you have an account on Bold already, then you do. You have to use a different email account. Unfortunately, the system doesn't support a mutual Bold and Bold SDP account at the time. At this time. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So I have one last quick question. I'm okay. sorry I keep asking about the sequence editing. I've basically gone... Uh, through this process, and um, I noticed an error I think, in the sequence that I want to correct, and I think it's just that they missed one thing at the end. So if I clear a sequence, will I, as the instructor, be able to view their traces, or do I need a student to re-log in to do that? Okay, so that's an excellent question. You will be able to view the traces. I'm going to see if I can find um, a record here. You you can still see my screen, correct? <laughs> Okay, so you'll be able to view the traces through this. However, going through the process, you won't have the same access from your, from your login. So you can click here and see view traces and it opens into a new page and you can, and you can say, oh, let me check the trace. So what you could do is based on viewing the traces, change the sequence by editing it but if you want to delete and go through the process again, you have to log in from the student account. Okay. But you but you have you have the login information, so you can pot potentially log in as a student if you. I see. Okay, I can pretend to be a student. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So uh, if there are no other questions, although, you know, feel free to ask questions. But if you have any comments or um, anything that you can think of about the system that you'd you'd like implemented in the future or, or any comments, it would be highly appreciated.